Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 104. Today, we're going to continue our exploration of the Mollusk Clade by turning our attention to the Bivalves, which are a group of very curious creatures encased in a protective, two-plated shell. In the previous episode, I opened up this series with a broad overview of early mollusk evolution, how they developed some of their most characteristic features. And then we took a look at several of the most primitive mollusk groups, including the aplacophorans, the monoplacophorans, and the polyplacophorans, also known as the chitons. These groups represent bottom-dwelling marine genera that scrape through the muck of the seafloor, their mouths oriented downwards in the search for food. The mono- and polyplacophorans enjoy the protection of shell plating along their back, offering passive defenses against any predators swimming overhead that would strike down at them. The bivalves are similar in the sense that they too often live attached to a rock or a coral or some kind of substrate along the seafloor, where they enjoy the protection of their shell. But unlike the placophorans, the bivalves have a shell that completely covers the visceral mass that is their actual soft tissue body. In addition, Bivalves include species that have adapted to freshwater habitats, whereas the placophorans only include saltwater-tolerant species. They're only able to live in marine habitats. The individual shell plates are called valves, so the term bivalves literally refers to their two mostly symmetrical shell plates. I want you to know that the technical term for these shells is valves, but I think that that term might be a bit confusing to a layman audience, because it implies something like pipes and a pressure system with uh, uh, valves, like, like a pneumatophore or something like that. So, for the rest of the episode, to avoid any confusion, I'll refer to each valve, each shell plate in a bivalve mollusk, as just that. I'll refer to it as a shell plate, or the shell. I want to do this because I feel like plate is a much better word for visualizing what we're talking about. Valve has those other connotations, and it could be confusing when discussing stuff like bivalve siphons and pores, and uh, like I mentioned a moment ago, things like the siphonophores seen in echinoderms. Anyway, the bivalve lineage was one of the many animal forms that emerged in the Cambrian explosion, which was, of course, less of an explosion and more of a prolonged period of heavy speciation that restructured the primordial ecosystem in radical ways from about 550 to 520 million years ago. During the early days of the Ordovician period, some 480 to 470 million years ago, so this is after about uh, 40 to 50 million years of uh, speciation and evolutionary divergence, the bivalves enjoyed widespread reproductive success. The fossil record around this time, 480 to 470 million years ago, provides evidence of very high bivalve biodiversity and the emergence of several traits that help to define modern bivalve phylogenies. By 400 million years ago, the bivalves were among, if not the most, successful filter-feeding marine animals on the planet. The bivalves also evolved the ability to burrow into the mud and sediment on the ocean floor allowing them to hide from predators. Siphon tubes evolved to extend outwards, protruding from the mud, so that the hidden bivalve could continue to eat and excrete waste. The bivalves really seemed to have hit on a winning strategy, as the clade continued to diversify and expand for many millions of years, for well over a hundred million years, in fact. But then, approximately 250 million years ago, Something happened that would come to be called the Permian-Triassic Extinction Event, or the Great Dying. The exact cause of this Great Dying is not conclusively determined, but it's suspected that heavy volcanic activity, methane-induced climate change, and slash or asteroid impacts created some sort of hellish condition on the surface of the Earth that wiped out more than 95% of all marine species. Virtually every aquatic organism, plant and animal alike, were savaged by this extinction event, and the bivalves, once so widespread and ecologically dominant, were not spared. 
their fate was no different. However, at least partially due to their burrowing behaviors, they were able to successfully integrate themselves into the new ecology that recovered after this terrible disaster, and their numbers recovered over the next few million years during the early Triassic period. A similar but unrelated clade known as the brachiopods fills many of the same ecological niches as the bivalves. But during the Permian-Triassic extinction event, the brachiopods were largely destroyed. Where the bivalves recovered and rediversified, the brachiopods have survived, but they've not fully recovered. In the modern day, some 250 million years after the Great Dying, the brachiopods have only recreated one-third of the biodiversity they had before the extinction. It was first theorized that the bivalves outcompeted the brachiopods. They did share the same ecological niche, after all. But subsequent analysis provided evidence that didn't support this idea. They provided evidence that showed that both lineages increased biodiversity at similar rates and both experienced concurrent setbacks whenever there was some kind of disruptive geological or atmospheric or otherwise environmental event. The relative success of the bivalves is credited largely to happenstance, rather than any particular feature or salient behavior demonstrating superior competitive fitness over the brachiopods. But in any case, the current bivalve biodiversity is understood to be around 9,200 known species, with estimates of the true number of species on the high end reaching up to 20,000 species. Like all mollusks, the bivalves have a layer of flesh that enshrouds their body, called the mantle. In most mollusks, the mantle is visually apparent, such as that on a squid or a chitin. But in the bivalves, it's a little more subtle. The mantle tissue is a thin membrane layer that encapsulates the soft body of the bivalve, known as the visceral mass. The mantle will secrete on its outer side layer upon layer of calcite and aragonite, which are two forms of calcium carbonate. Each shell plate has a high point, or a bump, called an umbo. This region of the shell represents some of the oldest secreted material, and as the shell grows, more layers of calcium carbonate are added along the distal edge. This growth pattern is what gives many bivalve shells their corrugated texture. They have many thin, shallow grooves running in concentric arcs orbiting the umbo, or running in concentric parallel lines with the larger edge of the shell. These grooves are evidence of the bivalve's growth cycles. In other cases, the shell is not grown by adding material to the edge, but instead is grown by adding more calcium carbonate to the layers already deposited, so as to thicken the plates and make them stronger and more protective. The two shell plates meet together at the hinge, where they're held together by a strip of tough ligament, which is rich with two types of keratin-containing proteins, called tensilium and resilium. The purpose of this ligament is twofold. First, and most obvious, the ligament holds the two shell plates together. It's the duct tape holding the whole show in one piece. The second, and more subtle purpose, is to provide passive tension that will lift open the shell. This opening force, created from the natural stiffness of the ligament, is countered by the adductor muscles on the inside. Inside the shell, the soft, fleshy body of the bivalve is really weird, even by mollusk standards. Virtually all other mollusks, be they tiny aplacophorans or giant cephalopods, they all have a distinct orientation to their bodies. They all have a distinctive bilateral symmetry, with a front and a rear end. Sure, it, it may look weird. Some of them, like the gastropods, may have noticeable torsion or a weird twisting asymmetry that's formed during their development, but at least it's something. A nautilus, for example, is a, a really strange cephalopod with a coiled shell. It coils up backwards behind their head. They have weird bulging eyes and a tentacle-shrouded mouth, and they swim backwards. But even with such a weird creature, 
you can still recognize body parts and make sense of its orientation and body form. You can still see the evolutionary logic in its body's design and its physiology and shape. But the bivalves, when it comes to their visceral mass, they are not like this. When you open up the hinge shell of a bivalve and look inside, what you see is a layered conglomeration of slimy, fleshy lumps and lobes. If you're not trained to recognize bivalve anatomy, it's highly likely that you won't be able to logically deduce what you're looking at. The organs and soft tissues have no real consistent symmetry. The gills are huge and they've been repurposed, so they're heavily mutated and distorted and they look like different things. While other structures, so typical of the mollusks, like the radula and the odontophore, are completely gone. And there's no head to speak of. The largest soft tissue structure within the shell is the foot. This muscular appendage can be stuck out of the shell like your tongue sticking out of your mouth. The rhythmic contraction of protractor and retractor muscles allow the foot to wave around, to wiggle and squirm and flex, and push off the surface to move around. Some bivalves, like oysters and a majority of scallops, lack these muscles entirely, and they can't move their foot around. The largest muscles in the bivalves are the adductor muscles. These dense wads of muscle are positioned on either side of the visceral mass, and they connect the shell plates together. By flexing the adductor muscles, the bivalve can close its shell and hold it shut tight, even against the prying claws of a larger predator, like an otter. As a result, these predators, like otters, have learned to just smash open the bivalve shell with a rock. It's a bit messier, but it still lets them eat the nutritious visceral mass inside. And of course, there are some evolutionary responses to otters smashing them against a rock. Some groups of bivalves have evolved thicker shells so that they're stronger, and it takes too much energy to break them open against a rock, and so a creature like an otter will just give up. Or they'll evolve to be smaller, and thus become less appetizing prey or a potential meal for a hungry predator. They'll look for something with a bit more meat on its bones, so to speak. Now, the largest organs in the bivalve's body are its gills. In simpler mollusks, like the chitons, the gills are small structures mounted along the sides of the animal's body. In the monoplacophorans, the gills are belly-mounted, where they ring the foot. But in the bivalves, the gills are mounted within the shell, where they can access oxygen from water flowing through the mantle, through those siphons. But the gills have also undergone significant adaptation to become the filter-feeding organs known as tenidia. This evolutionary adaptation, where the gills meant for respiration were transformed into tenidia for filter feeding, took place sometime in the early Silurian period, about 444 to 433 million years ago. Consider the fact that the gills have cilia, which are used to clear debris and keep the gill tissue clean. In the tenidia, the cilia have undergone extensive adaptation. Instead of clearing debris, they capture food particles and shuttle them through a stream of mucus towards the mouth. The cilia are elongated, and they can fold into various forms that create channels to optimize the flow of food. This food is typically algae and phytoplankton, but there are carnivorous bivalves that are known to eat zooplankton, and sometimes larger prey, like small invertebrates or even really, really small fish or fish larvae. This somewhat unique filter-feeding strategy evolved because the traditional mollusk mouth form with a radula and odontophore is untenable in the bivalve body plan. Think about it like this. In other mollusks, the mouth faces the external environment, and it's often pressed against rock or sediment. Then the radula, which is like a bony serrated tongue, comes out and scrapes the rock to loosen up the tasty algae particles. However, in the bivalves, the mouth is deep inside their shell, which fully encloses their body. So for the bivalves to eat like other mollusks, they'd have to open up their shell and then face plant onto the ground. Obviously, this really isn't a physiologically viable solution, 
it would place the bivalve in a state of extreme vulnerability, and it would flood their soft tissues with contaminating sediment. Instead, during the Devonian and Carboniferous periods, some 400 to 300 million years ago, the mollusks evolved a pair of tubes called siphons. These siphons functioned as an intake pore and an excretion pore. Food particles are sucked in through this intake pore, through this siphon tube, and then they're filtered through the tenidia, and then the excess and the waste is flushed out through the excretion pore, which is at the other end of the exit siphon tube. It's placed at the other end of the hinge. This particular physical arrangement has the benefit of keeping any contaminated sediment contained within an enclosed chamber with a unidirectional flow of water. In other words, this allows them to keep the mess in one place and to easily move the mess out of their body. Additionally, the rim of the shell and or the rim of the intake pore is often lined by small chemosensory organs, sometimes mounted on the tips of short tentacles. These chemosensory organs scan the incoming water, detecting the scent of desirable things like food particles and undesirable things like pollutants or sediment or toxins. Some species also possess a specialized patch of sensory cells called an osphradium, which isn't that well understood. The scientists who study mollusks believe that the osphradium is either an olfactory organ that smells or tastes the incoming water, or it's some kind of mechanosensory structure that can detect the turbidity of the incoming water. In the order Anomalodesmata, these carnivorous bivalves possess mechanoreceptory organs around the intake pore, which allows them to sense vibrations in the water caused by the flailing and struggling of some nearby prey animal. Now, having gills adapted into filter-feeding tenidia is the case for the majority of bivalves, although some species are an exception, like the protobranchs, which don't have tenidia, and instead feed in a more traditional way, by scraping food particles off the substrate. Other species are a bit more unusual, such as the Poromia granulata, which are carnivorous. These bivalves have an enlarged filtration system, allowing them to suck in zooplankton, small worms, and tiny crustaceans through their siphon tube. For bivalves, these are relatively huge prey items, so the Poromia granulata has also evolved a bird-like gizzard organ to help grind up and break down their food in the siphon chamber, in this siphon orifice. Whatever food they eat, and however they eat it, the food particles are consumed, they're swallowed, and they're brought to the stomach organ, where they're broken down through a combination of traditional gastric juice decomposition and a more unique digestive method where the stomach cells phagocytize the food particles and break them down intracellularly. When food is carried through the intestines, the waste is consolidated into little pellets that get excreted through the anal pore. Liquid waste produced by the nephridia is deposited outside the body in the mantle cavity, where it can be carried away by flowing water. When food is digested and broken down into chemical nutrients, those nutrients are then poured into an open circulatory system. The bivalve's blood is called hemolymph. It's a nutrient-rich, oxygenated slurry that bathes the organs. Oxygen that's absorbed from the gills and nutrients that are absorbed from the intestines are diffused across the hemolymph, where they then come into contact with and diffuse into the various specialized tissues of the body, like the muscles or the gills or the lungs or what have you. All right, so let's see. I've talked about the shell and mantle tissue, and then I mentioned the foot muscle and the adductor muscles. Then we talked about the gills for a while, and how some of the gills were repurposed into tenidia for filter feeding. And naturally, that led to us discussing the organs and intestines and excretory systems of the bivalves. Well, there's a few more organs and systems that I'd like to cover, and then I'll move on to the general ecology of the bivalves. So with that said, let's take a look at the bivalve nervous system. Now, you might think that the bivalves would have a nervous system that's at least as developed and at least as complex as that seen in the chitons, 
this would be a logical assumption, because the bivalves are a bit more derived than the chitons. But it would not be an accurate assumption. Consider the lifestyle of the bivalve. It's a largely, almost entirely sedentary creature. It isn't running or flying anywhere, it doesn't have seasonal migration patterns, and it doesn't have the inclination or the limbs to tackle and handle prey or to fight off predators. The bivalves are sedentary creatures that hide inside their shells, often burrowing themselves into the muck on the seafloor or anchoring themselves to some kind of hard surface where they're really not going anywhere, even in the face of a storm and heavy waves. As a result of this intentionally sedentary lifestyle, the bivalve nervous system has not really been subjected to much selective pressure, and it's, it hasn't undergone any major increases in function or complexity. After all, they don't have a brain. They don't have complex sensory systems that require heavy-duty neural hardware to process the signals, and because they don't have limbs, they don't have sophisticated or complex behaviors that have to be managed by a motor cortex or some kind of mollusk version of a cerebellum. The bivalve nervous system, like the other mollusks, is composed of a ladder-shaped nerve network with a pair of nerve cords running laterally along the side of the organism, with a collection of neural crosslinks bridging the space between them. At the junction of the lateral nerve and the crosslink, there's a ganglia mass, meaning that the latter organization is studded with pairs of ganglia. In essence, a ganglia is like a wad of neural tissue that's kind of like a miniature brain, although compared to a brain, a ganglion is very simple. It's a simple rudimentary structure that's usually only associated with a single body part or a set of body parts. It may be involved in, uh, for example, handling uh, some sort of reflex involved with that, uh, that limb or that body part. It doesn't have the, the, the foresight or the cognitive capacities of a traditional brain. For example, all bivalves have pedal ganglia, whose neurons innervate the foot muscle and control the movement and the tone of the foot. Similarly, the visceral ganglia innervate the adductor muscles, and thus they're involved in controlling the opening and closing of the shell. In bivalves that can swim by quickly flapping their shell plates open and closed, the adductor muscles are relatively large and powerful. The visceral ganglia which innervate them are also relatively large, as they're packed with the neural cell bodies of all of the nerves needed to innervate the large muscle mass. As an aside, you might think that that's a really, really silly visual of a bivalve, like a clam or something, flapping its shell plate open and closed really fast so that it can swim through the water. And... <laughs> I mean, yeah, that is a, it's a weird and silly visual, but that's actually what happens. It's crazy to watch videos of it. It looks ridiculous, but it's also kind of cool. It's some of the most motility that you ever see in bivalves. Then you have the pleural ganglia, which innervates the mantle cavity. This allows the mollusk to control the muscles around the cavity so that the flow of water can be adjusted as needed. In most species, the pleural ganglia control the opening and closing of the siphon tubes, but in the few species which have particularly large and articulating siphon tubes, they may have their own dedicated pair of ganglia. And then finally, there's the cerebral ganglia, which are positioned on either side of the esophagus. The cerebral ganglia innervate all of the sensory structures in the bivalve's body, such as the osphradium and the various mechanosensors and chemosensors lining the siphons in the mantle cavity. However, the, these aren't the only sensory structures in the bivalve. They're not the only organs that these cerebral ganglia innervate. They also possess organs called statocysts, which help detect their orientation in physical space. The statocyst is a spherical mass with an empty core, so it's kind of like a sack or an inflated soccer ball or something. The cells that line the inside of the statocyst are covered in small hairs, called sebi. These all point inwards, towards the inside of the statocyst cavity. And in this open space, there's a detached lump of mineralized tissue called a statolith. It's basically like a little pebble floating loosely within the statocyst, within the cytoplasm. When the bivalve is still, this statolith will be pulled downwards by the force of gravity. 
When the bivalve moves, either by pushing off with its foot, or by being knocked loose, or being moved by some other external force, then the statolith will bounce around according to the forces of inertia. And as the statolith moves around inside of the statocyst, it'll come into contact with these seti hairs. The little mineralized ball will press on them and bend the sensory hairs, and trigger neural activity. The associated ganglion that innervates the statocyst has mapped out where each seti is in relation to the others. So when one group of seti get activated by the pressure of the statolith pressing down on them from the force of gravity, this tells the bivalve cerebral ganglion that the force of gravity, or inertia, is working in that direction. In this way, the bivalves can orient themselves up or down, and they can sense when they've been knocked off balance and need to readjust themselves. It's a remarkably efficient little system, and functionally speaking, it's extremely similar to the system used in humans, but that's a different topic for a future episode. Perhaps the strangest sensory feature of the bivalves are their eyes. Now right off the bat, let me make it clear that most bivalves don't have eyes. Most species of clam and cockle, oyster and mussel, are all blind. Now all species of bivalve have small, scattered, light-sensitive cells that can detect changes in light intensity, like when the shadow of a potential predator sweeps overhead. But these collections of light-sensitive cells cannot form images. They're really just able to detect changes in light intensity, and only coarse changes at that. They aren't sophisticated enough to detect very subtle changes in light, or if, say, a small object moves in between them and a light source. They're really only sensitive enough to detect these, these big, coarse changes in the lighting of the environment. Now, with that being said, there is a small handful of bivalves that do have, honest-to-goodness, eyeballs. Some have just simple eyes, simple collections of light-sensitive cells covered with a lens that are arranged along the edge of the mantle. Unlike the primitive collections of light-sensitive cells, these simple eye structures are actually capable of forming images. But exactly how detailed and colorful and vivid these images are is still a matter of ongoing research. These bivalves may not have good vision, but they still have vision. And for such seemingly primitive creatures, that fact alone is pretty surprising. Now what's especially fascinating are the eyes of the scallops. These are bivalves of the family Pectinidae, and one of their most unique, identifying features are a series of small eyes that run along the edge of the mantle. These eyes are about one millimeter in diameter, but there can be dozens, if not hundreds of them, packed around the edge here. What's really freaky about these little eyeballs is that they are literally little eyeballs mounted on the ends of tentacles or embedded in the soft, fleshy rim of the mantle. These complex scallop eyes have two layers of retina. The inner layer senses sudden abrupt shifts into darkness, whereas the outer layer is sensitive to colors and slower changes in light. They also possess a lens and a concave mirror made of guanine crystals that allows them to partially focus the incoming light. Now, these eyeballs are some of the most advanced among all the bivalves, but as far as eyeballs in the animal kingdom goes, they're still pretty low quality. Compare them to, say, a bird's eyes, for example. They're definitely not that good. The scallop eyes can form images, and they can focus, and they can detect much more subtle changes in light compared to other bivalves, and because of their double retina, their ability to detect contrast is really strong. Scallops are even capable of detecting the movement of particles in the water to make inferences about the current and turbidity of the water and then to adjust their swimming or feeding behavior accordingly so that they can maneuver and feed optimally. But even with all of this taken into consideration, scallop eyes really don't have a very high resolution. Now the last bivalve body system that I want to talk about is their reproductive system. As bivalves are largely immobile, they generally engage in external fertilization, where they expel their gametes, either in a dribble 
or as a big burst out into the water of the external environment. Of course, the timing and the nature of the mating event depends on the species. In many species, there is no mating season. Individuals can mate whenever they meet up and decide to do so. Other species may be spurred into mating by environmental variables, like certain seasons, which they can detect by the length of daylight exposure, or by temperature, which can reveal both the season and the time of day. In any case, when the release of gametes occurs, the reproductive cells will meet, fertilize, and produce an embryo, encased in a slimy, soft egg. After a short time, the eggs will hatch, giving rise to bivalve larvae. This larval form and all of its intermediate stages are very small and quite unlike the mature body form. The larval form has no shell. Its body is the shape of a soft blob, or like a melted cube. Around the outside of its globular body, rows of cilia help it move through the water and consume food. A simple mouth pore exists along the front side, and an anal pore exists at the bottom, connected together by a simple linear digestive tract running through this tiny, simple body. This small, larval trochophore form drifts about, sucking up particles of food, before eventually growing into a larval villager form, or veliger form. Along its back surface, it grows the beginning of the shell plate. The tissue will curl below the soft body, establishing the basis of the two shell plates. And as the shell plate grows, the soft body itself is growing the foot and the organs. This veliger form feeds on algae, or egg yolk, from which it grows considerably while searching for a place that's suitable to anchor down. And once it finds a place and it's uh, nestled down and settled in, it'll undergo metamorphosis. This metamorphosis turns the larval veliger form into a juvenile form, which is usually similar in appearance to the adult form, but just much smaller. Usually by the time the individual has developed the juvenile form, or sometimes earlier, the bivalve adolescent will have embedded itself in the mud and burrowed away from the danger of predators. Here, safe in the mud, discreetly eating food particles through one exposed siphon and removing waste with the other, with the bulk of their body hidden in the sediment and muck of the seafloor, they will complete their maturation into the adult form. Now, as with all things biological, bivalve reproduction has its healthy dose of variation. For example, not all species practice external fertilization. Some species, such as the unusually small, pale, white saltwater clams of the genus Lycia, practice internal fertilization. The Lycia clams will sense the chemical cues of sperm in the water and suck it in through their intake siphon tube. Inside the body, the sperm can fertilize the eggs, and the embryos are brooded inside the female's mantle cavity until they're at least in the larval veliger form. There's a number of species, including members of the Lycia clams, but also many others, that spend a relatively long time in their egg sac. The larval trochophore, and in some species even the veliger form, will be grown inside the egg sac before hatching. Another clade that practices internal fertilization are the freshwater mussels of the Unionida order. These freshwater mussels will brood the eggs until they reach a specialized freshwater larval form known as a glochidia. In this form, the larvae look like extremely tiny, semi-transparent mussels with hooks in their larval shells. This unique glochidia larval form will use their hooks to latch onto the gills of fish. Unionidia are really fascinating for this. Their larvae are temporarily parasitic, hooking themselves to a fish's gills. Here, they actually won't do too much damage to the fish, they're not infecting it, but they are using it as a mobile platform that moves them through the water and brings them within proximity of food. After a short time, these glochidia larvae will encrust themselves in a cyst structure, mature into the juvenile form, and then hatch and detach from the fish. This is a fascinating example of bivalve ecology. It's not a hugely influential or particularly important ecological interaction, but it is really weird and unusual. <laughs>
And for that reason, it's really fascinating. In a more general sense, the bivalves are ubiquitous in the shallower waters of the world, including intertidal zones. As juveniles, they'll bury themselves in the sediment, and, for the most part, they'll stay there for their entire life. Using their foot, they'll make a little burrow for themselves, they'll dig themselves in, they'll poke out their siphon tubes above the surface of the seafloor, and then they'll just live like that for their whole life. The mussels will use a thready, fibrous, protein-rich substance to chemically anchor themselves to rocks and corals and other hard surfaces. Although this gets them out of the mud and a little bit off the ground, it also leaves them more exposed to predators. Many bivalves that live out in the open like this, and not underground or at least under a layer of mud, have evolved specialized shells. The bottom shell plate can be almost flat, and the top shell plate will be thickened and equipped with spikes and thorns to deter predators. In general, predators find the bivalves to be, in a word, frustrating. The bivalves have very strong adductor muscles, and they can keep themselves tightly closed, and their thick shells and awkward shape makes them hard for predators to handle and hold down, especially if uh, the predator is like an otter and it's just pulled them out of the water, and so the shell is wet and slippery. If a siphon tube gets ripped or bitten off, they can be regrown. Some species have evolved potent escape mechanisms, such as the rapid digging speed of the Pacific razor clams. The file clams of the Lima genus can flap their shell plates to swim away. Other file clam species have little tentacles, which break off when they're attacked. The tentacles writhe and wiggle and release a bad-smelling chemical that wards off predators. Some of the cockles use their foot like a spring or a lever to leap away from predators. And I mentioned earlier that the scallops have literal eyes, which allow them to see predators coming from a ways away and close their shells in anticipation. Despite these many defensive strategies, there are those predators that have evolved ways to counter them, to nonetheless get by the defenses and eat the bivalve. For example, certain snails will use their radula to bore a hole into the shell of the bivalve. They'll either make a large hole that they can fit their mouth in, or they'll make a smaller hole and then extend a proboscis to suck out all of the soft, wet tissue of the visceral mass. Some predators, like the octopus with its suction cups, or the starfish with its hydrostatic feet, will stick themselves to the shell plates and use raw muscular force to pry them open in order to get at the soft, visceral mass inside. Some bird species can also pry open the shells. Sea otters and walruses will just smash them against rocks, breaking them open with brute force to get at the tasty meat inside. Aside from this role in the food chain, the bivalves don't have any immediately obvious ecological benefit. To any layman observer, it would seem that they don't really do anything. They just hang out, usually buried in the mud, doing nothing but filter feeding with one siphon and shitting out waste with the other. However, when scientists did a closer analysis, they found that the bivalves play a critical role in cleaning the water column. By filter feeding all of the time, all of the bivalves are collectively cycling a huge amount of water through their bodies. Various pollutants, like metals or mineral particulate debris, can be sifted out and integrated into their shells. So in essence, they can bioaccumulate certain polluting compounds, removing them from the water. This comes at a cost, of course, as it can harm the bivalve and potentially could harm a predator if it ate a bivalve whose visceral mass was tainted with mercury or something. But in the aggregate, this ecological function, this filtering function, is of huge importance. To just briefly brush against the tip of the iceberg here, there are some insects that can only lay their eggs in clean bodies of water. If there's too much pollution, like too much bacteria, or too much algae or something like that, they can't lay their eggs, because their eggs or their larvae simply wouldn't survive in that contaminated environment. And so if you have a bunch of clams, uh, a bunch of bivalves of some kind, cleaning out this body of water with their constant filter feeding, 
They make it, uh, they make the water column, the body of water, cleaner and more habitable for these insects and for all sorts of other animals. Of course, the insects, if they can lay their eggs in a lake or a pond or a stream or something, and little larva insects are born from that, and adult insects are flying around mating and laying eggs, well, all of that activity is going to attract amphibians and reptiles and birds, and this in turn is going to attract you know, larger predators like various carnivorous reptiles and mammals and birds of prey. And before you know it, you have a whole ecology going on here around this body of water that was once too contaminated with algae, but then was cleaned up by some bivalves and allowed other things to move in. In this way, the bivalves are very real ecosystem engineers. They can help purify aquatic habitats and make them that much more habitable for all sorts of other organisms, for entire ecosystems. This is why this value is of huge ecological importance. And it's all thanks to the humble bivalve. All right, everyone, that's it for this episode. That's your look into the world of the bivalve mollusks. In the next episode, we'll be turning our attention to the slugs and the snails of the clade Gastropoda. It'll be a slimy, disgusting, badass episode. So subscribe to the channel to check it out. Hit that subscribe button right now. And while you're at it, hit that like button as well. It really helps the podcast with the YouTube algorithm, which always seems to be working against me as a, a small creator. You know, I don't know why, but that's just how it is. So hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, check out the official store if you want to, become a Patreon supporter if you really want to support the show. I super appreciate that. And as always, thank you so much for listening. Oh,